church. Good Turn this mic off so I can take it apart, Donald. Take it off. Before we get started, I just want to bring this picture to your attention. I don't know if anybody's paid attention to this, because uh, I want to put away this baby Jesus stuff, because there's no more baby Jesus, all right? Today, this is finished. We're going into a new year. Christmas is over. But do you, you pay attention to that picture? you see what's going on there? That's that picture that they're trying to portray there is, is baby Jesus, right? This is Father Joseph working in the carpenter shop. You see the shadow that's casting off the boy? It's a cross, huh? And you see what he's playing with? Three nails. Three nails. And you see his belt? It's a blue belt. What does that symbolize? What does that represent? The law. It's beautiful, isn't it? I think they really captured <coughs> what they were trying to do there. But Jesus isn't a baby anymore. Amen. Amen. He's um, he's our priest, our high priest in heaven, isn't he? And um, he wants to uh, put away his priestly robes <coughs> and put on his kingly attire and come and claim his people set up his throne here upon this world. Imagine that. Have to think about that for a moment. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We who slipped away, the only one that went wrong, will be lifted up <coughs> higher than you can imagine. I mean, you think, you stop and think that God put, him, put upon himself this flesh like you and I have. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. We might have just another quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for this last Sabbath of, of the year. And we just ask you to be with us, to lead us, to guide us, and to help us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin, um, I, I just, I'm just, just going to do some Bible reading. This isn't a real difficult talk that we're going to have today, okay? Um, I've named this talk, Are We Fully Persuaded? And that's a question we need to each, each one of us ask ourselves. Um, but if you'll turn to Romans, and we'll begin in the very first part of Romans, verse 1. But even above that, I have, I have a heading above Romans 4. And it says, Righteousness by faith, an Old Testament doctrine. Is the Old Testament, is it relevant today? Yes. Yeah. I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Because without the Old Testament, we wouldn't have the new. <laughs> All right, let's begin in verse 1. What shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Did, well, what did he do? He believed God. He believed God. Hmm. Not to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. What does that mean? If, if you're working, right, you get a paycheck. Right? Because you earn something. You deserve something. Right? What, what has Abraham done to be justified? Did he do any work? The, the Bible says that he believed God. Right? Alright. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth, on him that justifieth who? the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So, so why do we try to make this so difficult? Why is it that we as human beings think that we have to do all these amazing feats? You know? 
we we have to be really listening intently. That's what we need to do. Because we believe. And if we truly believe, then that's the way we're going to listen. Right? I have um, in my house, I get up kind of early. Um, my wife might say I go to bed a little earlier than she does, but I get up a lot earlier than everybody. And, you know, I'm tiptoeing through the house and it's dark and I don't want to disturb anybody. We got one cat that's real old and man, if you just stir her at all, she's going to start a fire engine truck just running. Just, ah! Ah! So anyways, real quiet. So I'm over to the sink this morning and it's very dark and I'm filling my glass of water. And I want to fill this glass of water, but I can't see it. I can't see it. Right? It's very dark. So I'm listening intently because I want a full glass of water. But I play a little game with myself because I want it as full as I can get it, but I don't want to spill it because if I spill it, I'm going to blow up. I'm just like a little kid. I play games, right? But, but you have to listen intently. You know what I'm saying? If we, if, if we go at God the same way of that kind of intentionality, if you would, that kind of listening, what are we going to get? We're going to get blessed, aren't we? Because do you think he's got something to say to you? I think he does. I think he's got lots to say to all of us. But I wonder how well we're listening. You know? we got another year that just flies through the books, and we're going to turn the page on a brand new one. And I know, I, I don't know about you guys, but the older I get, it seems like the faster it goes. You know, when I was a little kid, it seemed like it took all day to get to tomorrow. But now it seems like it takes all day to get to the next year. Anyways. <laughs> um, let's go in verse 6. Romans 4, verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I think he's trying to make a, a point here, do you think? This guy that wrote Romans was a very, very wonderful scholar. His name was Paul. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Ooh, do we believe that? Yeah. So why do people go around beating themselves up and wondering about their salvation? Why? If they truly believe what I just read, why would you go around defeated and wondering about your salvation and beat up? Well, we fall. <laughs> we do fall. We fall not because it's something that we're, we're seeking to do. It's because we, we just tripped, right? And we get up. You know, if, if we're intentionally sinning, then we're in a dangerous place. Very dangerous place. Because this, this, this sin thing has got to be dealt with. And that's what this whole sanctuary is all about. God's trying to deal with this sin that keeps coming up. And when that sin stops coming up, he can put on his Christ, his kingly robes and come. Now, does that mean that this, this end time people is going to be some kind of superhuman people? Not at all. But they're going to be what? Sold out. Lock, stock, and barrel. Self is left behind. Jesus Christ is first and foremost in their life. And they're listening intently because they want to be in the sanctuary with Him, finishing this work. Because we got to vindicate God, and He's vindicated in us. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. I mean, when you stop and think about it, the last generation is going to be the most feeble of, of us all. Right? I mean, we're not evolving, right? Amen. We're devolving. There's nothing getting better. If we walked away from this church and just shut the doors and came here three years later, do you think it would be wonderfully clean and looking good? No. 
It looked like Chernobyl. You know, dirty, filthy, nobody here. Let us continue in verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Is that who you want to be? Amen. Mm. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for, uh, for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Correct? So he did really just truly believe and God reckoned him righteous. Do you believe that God reckons you righteous today? Amen. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You see, we, we got a group of, of people that, that believe that the Jews are God's people, right? Mm -hmm. Who are the Jews? Spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel, right? Mm -hmm. If you can hold your finger on, on Romans chapter 4, and we'll just flip over to chapter 9, because mm -hmm. we're going to go back. And let us just start reading in uh, Romans 9, in verse 6, okay? Not as though the Word of God... Man, just took me out. <laughs> not as though the Word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they called children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. That isn't rocket science, is it? So if, if you've got a group of individuals, we'll say, big group, most of the evangelical world, believes that the Jews are God's chosen people. Right? So then, why has the Sabbath been done away with? Good question, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm just one of them end degree guys. It just, it puzzles me some things. Anyways, let's move on. Back to Romans 4 and verse 12. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Do you hear it? For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written in verse 17, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now, didn't, didn't this Abraham, didn't he father a child named Ishmael? Would, should he have done that? No. He was impatient. He, you know, his wife says to him, hey, you know, we're not getting it done here. 
God has promised you're going to have a son. This gal's right here. You know, you can just take her. We'll have a child. And, you know, Abraham, he's like, sure about You're okay with this? You know? I mean, I'm thinking from a man's perspective, right? He didn't have his eyes on God, did he? He took his eyes off God for a moment, didn't he? So he, he stumbled. But you've got to remember, God still called him righteous, didn't he? Because he believed. All right, what does that say about you and your walk with God? Is your righteousness thrown away because you, you, you fell? What do you do? You, you, you get back up, right? And you repent and you look to Jesus. Listen, I, I think a lot of our problem is, is well, I'm going to get into it further. Let's just continue. Who against, who against hope, in verse 18, believeth, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, who's he? God. God. He, God, was able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for what? Righteousness. righteousness. This is the only way we get righteousness, brothers and sisters, okay? is imputed. There's no other way. Okay? Because if you've told one lie in your life, you're a liar. Okay? If you've stolen one candy bar, you're a candy bar thief. Period. That's the way it is. That's the way the law judges. And what, what does the Bible say about sin? It's death, right? Something had to die. Jesus took that for you. He took that for all of us. 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. To whom it shall be imputed if we believe, if. Did you hear that big, huge, little, teeny word? If. Can you look that word up, if? What does if really mean? <laughs> yeah, very conditioned. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. In verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses. He was what? Delivered? What does that mean? Crucified? Can you use that word? Right? For our offenses and was raised again for what? For our justification. Can I, can I get an amen? amen. Whew, praise the Lord. Let's turn to Acts 17. Acts 17. Just a few little pages left. Acts 17 and 31. You all there? Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. Does that mean everybody? Sure does. In that he hath raised him from the dead. Amen? Amen. All right, I want you to turn to Psalms. <laughs> Psalm 1. Right after Job and right before Proverbs. So Acts 17.31 talked about judgment, didn't it? It said we're going to get before the judgment seat of Christ, correct? Alright, let's read Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsels of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. 
But what is his delight? The law of the Lord. In, the law of the Lord. In, in his law doth he meditate what? Day and night. Day and night. And it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the who? Righteous. Of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly <coughs> shall perish. I want to read you a little something from, from uh, one of my favorite authors. This, the resurrection of Christ is God's pledge to the world that every man shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That is settled. You and I expect it. We preach it. We believe it. Then why not put ourselves there and stand steadily there? Why wait? Those who wait and continue to wait will not be able to stand there. <coughs> The ungodly cannot stand in this judgment, but those who put themselves before the judgment seat of God, facing the standard of judgment and holding themselves there constantly in thought, word, and deed, are ready for the judgment any moment. Can I hear an amen? amen. Whoa, praise God. Ready for it. They have it. They are there. They are passing it. They are inviting it. The judgment. Do you hear the difference? Inviting the judgment. Who are you thinking of? When I, when I hear of inviting the judgment, I'm thinking of Esther. She has done everything she can do to prepare, and she's walking into that holy place, right? And she's coming before the king, and the king puts out his scepter to her, right? She's done all she can do, and she's what? Believing and trusting in God. She wants to be there. Right? That should be us as Adventists. There shouldn't be fear of the judgment. We should be wanting to be there. We're, we're not preaching hell fire that burns you forever. The Bible doesn't say it. It's not in there. Okay? You take one verse that says what? That you'll be burned with everlasting fire? If I burn something with that, if I burn that piano with everlasting fire, that does not mean that piano will burn forever. Right? So you have to discount the whole rest of the Bible to take one verse and make it say something that it doesn't say? Listen, the judgment's the same way. There's nothing to fear here, brothers and sisters. If we get before God and we're faithful, we believe, we're attentive to Him. In all that the judgment brings, they stand there expecting to be passed upon.